everybody, welcome to the Manaleek. I'm John, as always, and it's that time again. It is set review time, this time for Ravnica Allegiance, which we are a mere week away from getting our hands on on pre-release. Less on Magic Arena and MTGO. It launches on 17th. And if you go check out twitch.tv slash Manaleek on the 16th, I'm going to be playing Ravnica Allegiance sealed all day before anybody else who's not a streamer gets their hands on it. So make sure you check that out. But we're going to go over every card over the next seven days and talk about how it is in Limited. That's right, we're talking about limited only here. There might be cards that are amazing for legacy, and I might give them an F, because we're only talking about primarily draft, and to a lesser extent sealed. Most of the information is pretty darn uh, applicable to both. Keep in mind, I've not played with probably any of these cards, so these are my first glance uh, uh, expectations of how these cards will do. This is how I'm going to approach my first several tournaments for these cards. My opinions might change over time. Your opinions might be different, and I definitely want to hear them in the comments down below. This is not about me telling you what is true. This is about all of us having a discussion, getting to know these cards, and getting ready for this format. So, you agree with me, you disagree with me, you disagree with somebody else in the comment, you agree with somebody else in the comments, Use the comments, that's what they're there for, especially for these set reviews. Now, just before we jump into the set review, I do want to do something very exciting here and talk about Inked Gaming for a second and how you can get a free playmat. You might know I'm an Inked Gaming affiliate. Use the promo code MANALEAK10, all one word, one zero is the uh, number, to get 10% off your order at Inked Gaming, but I am now an Inked Gaming sponsored affiliate, which means I get more support from them and I, I work more closely with them, which can also mean some more giveaways for you guys. So if you go over to twitch.tv slash the Manaleek and you check out my stream on January 17th, where I'll be playing Ravnica Allegiance as it will have come out on both MTGO and Magic Arena. I don't know which one I'm going to play it on just yet. You will get a chance to win a playmat. If you haven't checked out my streams before, we do marble races during the streams. Marble races are basically a fancy way of doing a randomized giveaway. We actually play them for fun and keep track of points with the leaderboard system, but I also do use them when we do giveaways. So we'll be doing a Marble Grand Prix, which means for everybody who is there that day, we will do a series of races and the overall point total winner will get themselves a playmat. So go check that out, twitch.tv slash TheManaleek on January 17th, and go check out Inked Gaming and use the promo code MANALEEK10 if you do buy something there for 10% off your order. But without further ado, let's get into the first card of white. We'll be talking about all the white cards today, and up first is a heck of a card, Angel of Grace. Angel of Grace is three white white for a creature, Angel at Mythic. She's a 5-4 with flash, with flying. When Angel of Grace enters the battlefield until end of turn, damage that would reduce your life total to less than one reduces it to one instead. You can also pay four white white and exile her from your graveyard, should she happen to be there. Your life total becomes ten. This is just a straight up bomb. The floor of this card, the worst it could be, is an A. It's a flash flying 5-4 five, for five. That's insane. You would snap first pick that. It will just end games. It demands an answer. The middle ability is generally just going to be flavor text. You should basically never be keeping this back waiting to make use of it. Sure, you might have that opportunity where you top deck it and you're about to die and at the end of their turn or, or just before you're going to die, you play it and haha, you don't quite die and you maybe get back into it. But you should never be keeping this card back waiting for that situation. It should be cast the second you get it and have the mana or, or the second you can do it on the end of their turn, of course, just for maximum value. But it does give you a cool story if it happens to save your life there. The final ability is nice because if your angel dies, which your opponent's certainly going to hope that it dies, you do maybe get an extra turn or two worth of health depending on just how far down you've gone. I think this is just a straight A+. Plus. The stats plus the flying plus the flash plus the potential of those uh, uh, other things being relevant is just super good. A+, plus, super good card. Great way to start out the Ravnica Allegiance set review. Up next is Angelic Exaltation. Angelic Exaltation is... Three and a white for an enchantment at Uncommon. Whenever a creature you control attacks alone, it gets plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is the number of creatures you control. We're going to talk a lot about this over the next seven days. There are a lot of enchantments in this set, a lot of bad enchantments in this set. I don't know if this means we're going to an enchantment set some point in the future, but there's a lot of them, and this is one of the bad ones. Four mana for a do-nothing enchantment. I have to attack alone with what will most likely be my flyer, given the Orzhov Spirits or the blue-white flyers deck. Just no. If I'm filling my board with flyers, which both of those decks kind of want to do, I want to attack with my whole team. I don't just want to attack with one. This sounds 
great, but you're just not going to pull off anything with this, I don't think. I'm going to pre stand pretty firm here with an F. I don't want to handicap myself like this and force myself to attack alone. So I'm going with an F on ang Angelic Exaltation, and expect a lot of Fs for enchantment cards over the next week. Archway Angel is up next. Archway Angel is 5 and away for a creature angel at Uncommon. She's a 3-4 with flying. When Archway Angel enters the battlefield, you gain 2 life for each gate you control. Um, yeah, this isn't the gate payoff that I'm super looking for. You know, it's definitely not Gargoyles uh, or, or the Glaive that we saw in Ravnica, or Guilds of Ravnica. 2 life per gate, I just don't really care about and a 3-4 flyer for 6 is kind of costly it's probably 100% playable and fine and sealed as just a dumb 3-4 flyer uh, it's probably a little bit more cuttable in draft so I think it's still like a C and if you're in the gates deck I think it's probably still just a C uh, spoiler alert I do think the gate deck looks a little bit better the payoffs do look a little bit better in this set this just isn't quite one of them so C for Archway Angel up next is Arrester's Zeal. Arrester's Zeal is a single white mana for an instant at common target creature gets plus two plus two until end of turn. It has Addendum, which is Zorius's mechanic, which is basically if you cast the spell in your main phase, they're always instant or flash things, then you get an additional benefit or a different benefit. In this case, if you cast the spell during your main phase, that creature gains flying until end of turn as well as the plus two plus two. So this is a totally fine trick. Plus two, plus two in combat for one is fine. It's not giant growth, but it's still pretty darn decent. It's a, it's a C. You'll play it if you have a spot, and if you don't, it's fine. You can cut it. Flying, if you play this in the main phase, could end a game, and that's actually a really kind of good extra bit of versatility here. You have a 4-4. Four, four, oppo your opponent doesn't have a flyer, and suddenly you've got a flying 6-6. Six, six. You've got more than a lava axe coming in for one mana. Um, so this is actually a, a pretty darn decent trick. I've almost talked myself up to a C+, plus, that you should always include this in your deck. I don't think I'm going to go that high on a combat trick. I'm going to keep it at a C. Play it. Don't play it. I think you'll be fine either way. Bring to Trial is up next. Bring to Trial is two and a white for a sorcery at common. Exile target creature with power four or greater. Uh, so this is basically an upgrade to Smite the Monstrous with one downgrade. Uh, it's one mana cheaper and it exiles. That's incredible compared to Smite the Monstrous, but it is a sorcery instead of an instant, which is kind of a little bit of a downer. Uh, this is still a sideboard card. In best of one, you can probably main deck this. Uh, I'm not going to go too much into this. I go into a little go into it a little bit tomorrow as well. Best of one on Arena is very, very different. You play a lot of cards that you would never, ever play main deck in best of three. Uh, this set review is mostly about best of three. I will occasionally call out where a card might be different in best of one, uh, but the entire set review is still very applicable to best of one, of course. Uh, but this is a, a good example of a card that you might play in best of one, just because you need something to deal with those Simic creatures and those big, uh, uh, big, big boys. And, and this is a great way of doing that. Uh, but in best of three, you have the opportunity to play a better card in game one. And then if you find out, oh, there is actually some really big things over there, then you bring this in and it'll be a really good card to bring in. Three mana, kill, probably a very uh, big threat. Turn off its afterlife because it's exiled or any leave the battlefield effect. Uh, this is a very, very, very strong. Uh, I, I'm actually not even going to go with a D plus because I think you could play this as a 23rd card if you were desperate. So I'm going to go C minus on this, uh, but generally don't main deck this and side it in when it's relevant and be pretty darn happy with it. So C- minus for Bring to Trial. Up next is Civic Stalwart. Civic Stalwart is three and a white for a creature elephant soldier at common. It's a one one. When Civic Stalwart enters the battlefield, creatures you control get plus one plus one until end of turn. This is okay. It's like the angel from Dominaria that did this, but gave vigilance. Uh, but with a whitish board, especially with flyers, which I think both Azorius, well, definitely Azorius, uh, but Orzov as well will have, uh, could be a bit pretty sizable bit of damage coming through. And you get a three three left over for only having to pay one extra mana over a vanilla test cost of uh, three for three. Uh, but this is a totally fine C. And if you're a go wide deck, it probably even goes up to like a C plus. You'd always play it. It's not a high pick at all, but you might be totally happy with this. So C, C plus for Civic Stalwart. Up next is Concordia Pegasus, a reprint from Return to Ravnica, uh, possibly from original Ravnica too, I can't remember. Concordia Pegasus is one and a white for a creature Pegasus at common. It's a one three flyer. And that's it. There's not much else going on here. It's just a 1-3 flyer for two, and I, I didn't really care for it last time around in RTR, and I don't really care for it here either. Blue-White is the flyer's deck, and Azor uh, Orzov, I think, will also be relatively fly -y, but there's just better flyers out there. 
it's a one three for two it's a 23rd card that you can play if you really need it but you should cut it pretty regularly and just find better cards it just doesn't do enough damage for a two drop uh people will often say well it blocks really well but you generally shouldn't be planning on blocking especially not in either of the white decks i don't think um, that's really much more of like a blue black kind of thing as we saw in guilds of ravnica so i've got concordia pegasus at a c minus i think you cut it as often as you can you can play it if you're desperate but i don't think you generally want to up next is exposed to daylight exposed to daylight is two and a white for an instant at common destroy target artifact or enchantment scry one uh this is a sideboard only card We'll have to see if it's good in best of one or not. If there's a lot of artifacts and enchantments running around, there are a lot of enchantments in this set. They're not very good. Um, so I don't know if this will actually be main deckable in best of one, but in best of three, you're never, ever, ever going to main deck this card. It should sit in your sideboard. And then when you see that, aha, uh -huh, there is actually a very scary aura or enchantment or artifact, you side this in and it's fantastic. It's three mana, it's instant speed, and it even scries one. A uh, very, very solid sideboard card, D plus for Exposed to Daylight. Up next is Forbidding Spirit. Forbidding Spirit is one white white for a creature spirit at uncommon. It's a three, three. When Forbidding Spirit enters the battlefield until your next turn, Creatures can't attack you or a planeswalker you control unless their controller pays two for each of those creatures. It's kind of a temporary prison for just one turn. That's sort of cool. And this is a 3-3 three, three for 3, which means we're looking at a C at the bare minimum here. A 3-3 three, three for 3, vanilla test passing, cool, fine, whatever, I'll play it. The ability probably pushes this up to a C+, plus, but I don't think it goes that much higher. I think both white decks are relatively aggressive, and disallowing your opponents from attacking meaning their creatures are sitting there ready to block, doesn't really help you out. You want to be bouncing those creatures, you want to be tapping those creatures, making them not be able to attack for a turn or make it expensive doesn't really help you out that much. So I, I'm still to see plus on this. I don't think I'd ever cut it, but I'm not super excited for it or going out of my way to pick it up. So C plus for Forbidding Spirit. Up next is Hazda Officer. Hazda Officer is two and a white for a creature human soldier at common. It's a 3-2. When Hazda Officer enters the battlefield, target creature you control gets plus one, plus one until end of turn. Very, very filler card here. It's a vanilla 3-2, which is just kind of a C. You'll play it if you're desperate for a creature, and you'll not play it if you just have better stuff. Giving another creature plus one, plus one for a turn really isn't worth even a fraction of a grade. It just doesn't change this card. It's just a straight C. Play it, don't play it. I'm not a cop. I can't make you do that. C for Hosta Officer. Just straight boring filler. Up next is Hero of Precinct 1. We've heard a lot about the 10th Precinct, but Precinct 1. Hero of Precinct 1 is one and a white for a creature human warrior at rare. She's a 2-2. Two -two. Whenever you cast a multicolored spell, create a 1-1 one -one white human creature token it's a c if you have zero multicolored spells it's it's a bear it's still fine you'll still play it if you have a spot and once you get beyond about four or five multicolored cards this definitely jumps up to a c plus i still don't think it's going to make the b range unless you're somehow always getting this on turn two and every spell you have left is a multicolored spell but it's still a very solid c plus uh, i i definitely think selesnia could have desperately used this card last set um this is in the wrong set so c plus for hero of precinct one up next is impassioned orator impassioned orator is one and a white for a creature human cleric at common it's a two two whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control you gain one life uh it's a bear it's an upside bear uh, it's a 2-2 two, two for 2 with uh, some extra sort of ability, which used to be really good, and that was kind of my definition of a C+. Um, but in the past, maybe three, four sets, bears with upsides are the new normal. Um, so this is a relatively vanilla bear. Getting a few extra life over the course of the game is just not worth a grade. Um, so I think this is still just going to sit at a C. It might even be a C-. minus. Uh, a lot of newer players, of course, will see that and go, aha, I could gain like 15 life, but you won't. Games don't go that long. You don't play that many creatures. You're going to gain one, two, three, maybe four life, and that's just not worth anything. Um, so C for Impassioned Orator. I, I think you generally should not play this card if you can. But if you have to, it's not the worst thing in the world. 
Up next is Justicier's Portal. Justicier's Portal is a one and a white for an instant at common exile target creature you control, then return that card to the battlefield under its owner's control. It gains first strike until end of turn. This is interesting, and I think new players will 100% try to play this during combat after blockers and not understand that it removes the creature from combat. Do not play this on an attacker because you don't have an attacker anymore. Do not play this on a blocker because you do not have that creature blocking anymore. You have to play this as a defensive card at the latest at declare attacks, and then it will come back with first strike and then you can block it. Don't fall into that mistake. Since this is basically a 100% defensive card, I'm not sold on this plan. Um, if you're not planning on attacking if you're planning on not attacking you're probably not going to be winning too many games of magic uh, um, there's there's very few decks that want to desperately plan on just blocking um, now this can also try to abuse etb triggers so if you do have a bunch of really beneficial etb triggers this will get you a an extra activation of them and that's kind of cool but i don't think that's going to come together very often so i'm going to put this at a d i think you probably should just never play justiciers portal Knight of Sorrows is up next. Knight of Sorrows is four and a white for a creature human knight at common. It's a 3-3. Three, three. Knight of Sorrows can block an additional creature each combat, and it has Afterlife 1. Afterlife is uh, Orzov's new mechanic, and it basically makes everything into a doomed traveler, or two doomed travelers, or three doomed travelers. Uh, when it dies, you get a 1-1 one, one white and black flying spirit creature token, which is a very good ability. Doom Traveler was a 1-1 one, one for one. When it died, you got a 1-1 one, one flyer. It was a solid, solid, solid card. Um, so no surprise, really, that all the Afterlife cards are generally relatively solid, but I don't think this is one of them. Five mana for a 3-3 three, three is a very tall ask. That's very expensive. And blocking a second creature typically isn't that relevant. Again, like I just said, planning to block is not a great plan A for your draft. It's a plan B, it's a plan C, it's a plan D. It's not a great plan A. Getting a spirit after it dies does help a little bit, but the cost is just still too high for me. I think I'm gonna keep this at a C minus. I'm gonna cut it as often as I can, but it's not unplayable. Five mana for three, three, just way too much for me. C minus for Knight of Sorrows. Up next is Lumbering Battlement. Lumbering Battlement is four and a white for a creature beast at rare. It's a four or five with vigilance. When Lumbering Battlement enters the battlefield, exile any number of other non-token creatures you control until it leaves the battlefield. Lumbering Battlement gets plus two, plus two for each card exiled with it. This is really cool uh, flavor. The mechanic really gives you kind of the flavor of what's happening here. I'm just not sure how good it is. If you're comfortable throwing all your creatures into this, then you're already winning. Aren't you? If you don't need a board presence and you have a big board presence, aren't you just attacking and winning anyways? What does this do for you other than putting everything into one basket? You get them back if it dies, but... So, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. I, I think it's more of a win more card. If you're behind, this is pretty mediocre. You, you don't really have a board state. It's just a 4-5 for five with Vigilance. That's okay, but it only stops one creature. I don't know. It feels cool. I, I really like how the mechanic works and how the flavor uh, intersects with it. But I think it just feels cool and is more of a win more card than anything else without any sort of uh, uh, evasion. I think it's probably a C, but that's about it. You, you can play it because it's a big dumb creature if you need it, but I don't think you really want to go out of your way or spend a real pick on this. So C for Lumbering Battlement. Up next is Ministrant of Obligation. Ministrant of Obligation is two and a white for a creature human cleric at Uncommon. She's a 2-1 with Afterlife 2. Ah, uh, yeah, she's pretty decent. Now, I am going to assume that she flies way too often because if you just don't quite look at her feet, she looks like she's flying, but she does not. Uh, but yeah, she's a 2-1 for 3, which is a slightly expensive piker, but still probably okay in a relatively aggro deck. And when she dies which your opponent's probably not going to want her to, which means they might not be attacking you or they might never block, you get two 1-1 one, one flyers, which are really good. So I think uh, Ministrant of Obligations is a very solid C+. Um, it's kind of mid-pack pickup. It's not too much higher than that, but I think you're going to be happy with as many of these as you can get in every white deck. C+, for Ministrant of Obligation. Up next is Prowling Caracal. Prowling Caracal is one and a white for a creature cat at common. It's a 3-1, which means it's a blade. It's a vanilla one and a white 3-1. 
Loading Ready Run is trying to make Blade happen. Um, yeah, I love three ones for two in white. If you've watched my content before, you know that this is one of my pet cards, Raptor Companion and uh, Aresco Swift Blade and etc. They're not great, but they are my jam. It's a very low pick, but I treat these as very solid Cs, and I probably play them a little bit more often than I should. They die to everything. They die to everything any sort of burn any sort of minus x minus x unless for some reason it's minus zero kill these things but if they don't die and if they can attack they do a lot of damage really fast you can really take advantage of a slow start with these things so i've got these at a very strong solid c they're honestly probably a little bit more like a c minus and if you're not an aggro deck you probably should cut these pretty hard so c for prowling caracal always happy to see a three one for two Rally to Battle is up next. Rally to Battle is three and a white for an instant at uncommon. Creatures you control get plus one, plus three until end of turn. Untap them. This is going to get me so many times and be so annoying. It's a super defensive spell. So again, I'm not really likely to play this very much just because it's very reactive. I'd never play a mass pump spell that was plus one, plus X. If my plan was attacking, I, I want trumpet blasts. I want plus two. I want to tap my opponent's team. I, I don't want plus one so for me this is really like a d plus i know people are going to play this more than that um i i'm going to slightly underrate this and a lot of people are going to heavily overrate this realistically it's probably like a c minus but i'm taking a stand here and going d plus on rally to battle up next is resolute watchdog resolute watchdog is a single white mana for a one three creature hounded on common it's a defender Pay one, Sacrifice Resolute Watchdog. I guess it's tied up. Target creature you control gains indestructible until end of turn. Not a huge fan. Um, it, it's just, it's not really gonna do much. It's a 1-3 defender, which even for one mana costs you a card in your deck. A lot of you have probably heard this, but if you're newer to the game or newer to my set reviews, the most expensive thing is a card in your deck. You only get about 23 of them. And putting something that just does not actively really help you win the game in your deck is a huge cost so yes this is cheap to cast but it's very expensive to play the lure of giving a creature indestructible for one turn is meh. i'm not really looking to play this i might side it in if it turns out that i need something to block some early aggro from a rakdos deck or a gruel deck but a one three is not gonna do that for very long so i've got this at a d i think you keep it in your sideboard i think you never main deck it um but maybe you bring it in honestly i don't think you do so d for resolute watchdog up next is Sentinel's Mark. Sentinel's Mark is one and a white for an enchantment aura at uncommon. It has flash, enchanted creature, of course. Enchanted creature gets plus one, plus two, and has vigilance, but addendum. When Sentinel's Mark enters the battlefield, if you cast it during your main phase, enchanted creature gains lifelink until end of turn. Which is cool, I guess. This isn't that great. A plus one, plus two aura just isn't the aura I'm really looking for, but getting to probably save a creature in combat and keep the combat trick around it is generally nice uh, i generally do slightly underrate those abilities and, and people tend to very heavily overrate them uh, but casting this main phase is just not something i ever want to be doing giving a creature plus one and lifelink for a turn is not an effect i want to actually pay mana for and put a card in my deck for uh, as usual this has the aura problem of being a very high two for one potential you pay a card to put the creature down you pay a card to put this creature down your opponent pays one card and they get rid of two of yours and that's just bad so i've got sentinels market a d plus i could potentially see games where i side this in uh, but not very many so d plus for sentinels mark up next is Sky Tether. Sky Tether is a single white mana for an enchantment aura and uncommon enchant creature. Enchanted creature has defender and loses flying. This is sideboard only, and even then, I'm not a huge fan. Allowing a creature to still block is not a great card. We've seen this before, and it's not that great. Sure, that scary 6-6 six -six is not attacking you anymore, but you're also never attacking through it. So it's not that good. The best place for this is a blue-white skies deck as it keeps your flyers attacking if they play one flyer. They play one flyer, you play this, and haha, you get to keep coming through because you're flying over top of it. But I still don't think I'd main deck it there just because they may not have a flyer. It may not be important. And remember, cards are expensive in your deck, even though this costs one mana. But 
if after game one you see, oh, there are the, there were some flyers I need to deal with, then you certainly side this in, and I think it's going to be a great D-plus sideboard card in those situations. In a non-skies heavy deck, though, I think you probably just never play it unless there's a super problematic flyer that you just cannot possibly deal with. So I've got this at a D-plus uh, sky tether. Don't play it main deck. Up next is Smothering Tithe. Smothering Tithe is three and a white for an enchantment. At rare, it says whenever an opponent draws a card, that player may pay two. If that player does not, you create a colorless treasure artifact token with tap, sacrifice this artifact, add one mana of any color. It's treasure tokens from Ixalan, they're back. That's really cool, this is really cute, but I think it's ultimately meant for multiplayer commander. And that's about it, where you could potentially rack up several treasures by the time it gets back to your turn. Starting to get ramp on turn four in white is not my jam. This is too cute. It does too little. It doesn't affect the board. It doesn't get you any closer to winning. And if your opponent really doesn't want you to get the advantage from it, they can just pay their two. And you have a literal actual do nothing card i don't think you should ever play this uh i i think this is yet another of these f unplayable enchantments we're gonna see more this week up next is spirit of the spires spirit of the spires is three and a white for a creature spirit at uncommon it's a two four it's got flying and other creatures you control with flying get plus zero plus two this is fine it's a two four flyer for four which is fine we usually pay that for a 2-4 not flyer and it blocks pretty nicely it's not exciting and if i'm in the air i'd much prefer a power boost than i would prefer a toughness one but still this is probably an always play in both white decks and if you're a flyer heavy deck and looking to maybe uh, be a little bit slower for some reason this bumps it up to like a b minus uh, i think in the average deck this is just a totally fine c plus you'll probably just always play it and if you do have a, a, a preponderance of flyers it might even creep up into a b minus but i think that might be a bit too high so c plus for spirit of the spires up next is summary judgment summary judgment is one and a white for an instant at common summary judgment deals three damage to target tapped creature addendum if you cast this spell during your main phase it deals five damage to that creature instead this is probably just super solid white removal. For some reason, I thought this was a sorcery for a minute, but it's not. Um, yeah, so you're typically going to be using this for the non-addendum part. This is kind of like a slightly beefed up Slash of Talons. This says deal three damage to target attacking creature. Uh, now, only dealing damage to attacking creatures is generally less good than attacking or blocking, and it is only three damage, which means it doesn't kill anything. So this is very far from being premium removal. Now, the addendum is cool because that's going to kill most of everything in the format, but the secret is the addendum one is sorcery speed, which means it does technically say deal five damage to target creature that has already dealt damage to you. And that's not a super great piece of removal. So this is a fine piece of sort of second tier white removal that we've seen, you know, several times in several sets. So I think it's ultimately going to be like a C plus. People are going to overrate it a little bit too much thinking it is just straight removal, but there's a whole bunch of conditions going on here. So C plus for summary judgment. Syndicate Messenger is up next. Syndicate Messenger is three and a white for a creature bird at common. It's a two, three with flying. And after life one, you get yourself a ghost bird. This is probably f really fine. I, I do prefer 3-2 flyers for 4 rather than 2-3 flyers for 4, but it's not the end of the world. And if it dies, it replaces itself with another 1-1 one, one flyer. This will pretty likely quietly be the absolute bread and butter of both white decks, the blue-white and the white-black. It's not amazing. It's not going to be a pick that you take pick 1 or 2 or 3 or 4 or maybe even 5. But I think at least a pair of these in every single white deck is going to be basically people's quiet, realistic dream. Strong, strong C-plus here for Syndicate Messenger. Uh, I, I don't think you should sleep on this card. I, I think it's really, really decent, and you're going to actually want as many as you can. 10th District Veteran is up next. 10th District Veteran is two and a white for a creature human soldier at common. She's a 2-3 with Vigilance. Whenever 10th District Veteran attacks, untap another creature you control target creature of course a two three vigilance for three that 
basically gives another creature vigilance is fine. It's not super exciting, but it's probably an always play, I would think. Uh, so C plus for this, but I don't think you take it anywhere before mid pack. Uh, but it is a fine creature. You're, you're not going to feel bad playing this card. So C plus for 10th district veteran. Up next is Tithe Taker. Tithe Taker is one and a white for a creature human soldier at rare. It's a 2-1. During your turn, spells your opponent's cast cost one more to cast, and abilities your opponent's activate cost one more to activate, unless they're mana abilities. Afterlife, one. The first ability isn't really that exciting and limited. Your opponent's not casting that many spells on your turn, and having to pay one more honestly isn't really that big of a deal. It's such a tiny burden. The afterlife, though, is great. A 2-1 two, for 2 that replaces itself when it dies with potentially what could be considered a better creature, it's only doing 1 damage but it's flying, is super solid. Uh, Afterlife looks like a really strong mechanic. <laughs> I'm kind of afraid of it. Luckily it doesn't seem like there's that much of it floating around, uh, but it's going to be really, really good. Don't sleep on it. Doomed Traveler was always fantastic. Uh, I'm not going to jump up and down to see this card as my rare, because I do think it's literally just a 2-1 Afterlife 1 and that's it. But I'm still never, ever cutting this card. So C plus for Tithe Taker. Very far from a first pick, but always play it. Twilight Panther is up next. Twilight Panther is a single white mana for a creature cat spirit at common. It's a 1-2, and you can pay a black to give Twilight Panther death touch until end of turn. This is insane. This is Mardu Hateblade from Cons of Tarkir exactly except it's a cat spirit instead of human warrior and it gets an extra point of toughness with literally no downgrades except it's a cat so i'm allergic to it um this card's very 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 good in black white and you should be picking this the second you think you're going to be orzov um it, it might look very unassuming but this card is a very solid c plus and i think i might actually bump it up to a b minus assuming you're in Orzov. Um, trust me, I've played with this card back in Cons of Tarkir, and it was very, very, very good. Uh, obviously, if you're Azorius, you never play this, because it's a 1-2 one, one, for 1, and that's unplayable. But if you are Orzov, this is a strong pick, and an always, always, always play in multiples if you can. B-minus for Twilight Panther, assuming black-white. Our second last card for white today is Unbreakable Formation. Unbreakable Formation is two and a white for an instant at rare creatures you control gain indestructible until end of turn. Addendum, if you cast this spell during your main phase, put a plus one plus one counter on each of those creatures and they gain vigilance until end of turn alongside that indestructible. This seems fine and it will probably end games. I just, I don't know if I want to cast this just randomly to get some counters and not end the game. The defensive capabilities are here, but eh. And being rare means that you probably should just never play around this, which means you will get blown out by it. Uh, unless you know for a fact, unless you saw in game one they had it, you still should just never play around this. It's not a rare that I want to see, but it's probably fine if you are in a go wider strategy. Obviously works really well with, for example, Hero of Precinct 1. If you can just magically draft two good rares, or not two good rares, but two rares that go well together uh, in a single draft. Ultimately, this is probably like C plus-ish. It works well if you do have a large flying force uh, that's gone pretty wide, uh, but I, I, I think this is a card that actually, I'm gonna go back down to a C, just because there's a lot of decks where you just don't end up playing this card. Um, and, and some decks where it could be upwards of good, we'll say. So C for Unbreakable Formation. And our final card for today is Watchful Giant. Watchful Giant is five and a white for a creature giant soldier at common. It's a three six. And when Watchful Giant enters the battlefield, create a one one white human creature token. No. That's actually all I wrote in my notes for this. No. Um, I'm not playing a three six for six. That does nothing. It blocks, but we've talked several times now in this very video that blocking shouldn't be your plan. And you get a 1-1, one, one, I guess. So it's technically a 4-7. That's still not good enough. This is so expensive and so doesn't do anything. You should just never play this card. If you never play this card in the entirety of Ravnica Allegiance, you will probably have a higher win percentage. D- for Watchful Giant. It's just not good. Not good. 
So that's going to wrap it up for the white set review. White looks interesting. Afterlife looks very, very, very strong. Luckily, there's not a ton of it in the set. It's kind of sprinkled and it's very much Afterlife 1 with some Afterlife 2 uh, and an Afterlife 3. Uh, but yeah, White has Angel of Grace, which I think might just be one of the best uh, bombs in Limited. And it's got some other very cool cards. It definitely has some sideboard cards and it's got some weaker stuff. But I am very, very excited to play Orzov and Azorius in this draft. Let me know what cards you're excited about. Let me know what cards you agree with me on, you, you disagree with me on. As I said, this is not me telling you the truth about what these cards are and how good they are or not. This is me starting the discussion. Uh, so discuss with me, discuss with each other down in the comments below. As always, if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, you can find me on Twitter at the Mana Leak. That's L-E-E-K, like the vegetable, not the card. You can find me at Facebook.com slash Mana Leak, Twitch.tv slash Mana Leak, uh, both next Wednesday where I will be playing Ravnica Allegiance before anybody else on on Magic Arena, and on the 17th, where we'll be doing the Inked Gaming Playmat giveaway uh, at some point during that stream, so you can get yourself a playmat. And if you do want to get a playmat, go to InkedGaming.com and use the promo code MANALEAK10, all one word, one zero as the number, to get 10% off at checkout. If you like the content, click that thumbs up button, click subscribe if you want to see more. I would love if you shared this to uh, your social medias or whatnot, if you, uh, you know, want to get my name out there and uh, get this channel growing some more. But if you do have questions, comments, or suggestions, let me know. Otherwise... I'm going to see you all tomorrow for the Blue Set Review.